Well, I appreciate this service, man. It, this makes it really easy, really easy when, when people are worshiping and, and the presence is so thick like this. And there's all that prayer going up. Man, that is, that's really, really good. That's awesome. Thank you for that. So this is something that has been on my heart for quite some time. And I, I've never really, I, I don't know, I just never really felt like the Lord really wanted me to, to minister the message so, until tonight. So when I, when I prayed, you know, and started to ask God for direction, you know, there's always those certain things that, you know, I like to, to talk about, to teach, to preach or whatever. And uh, this isn't exactly one of them, but this is a really important topic. It's so simple. It's such a message that's so simple. And this, this has to do with the foundation. It's like a foundation that has uh, like a, a pavement that has the, the decorations of rocks or, or any kind of um, engraved into it or... or uh, inlaid in the pavement and this is like part of we know christ and what he did at calvary uh the father sending his son to come down to have his earthly ministry to die on the cross to ra be raised from the dead that is the foundation right that is the foundation of what we believe and what we stand on and right in line and in step with that is forgiveness right what got me into the faith was forgiveness <laughs> thank god that God forgave me. Thank God that his son, Jesus Christ, made it possible. And there's a lot of focus on the vertical forgiveness. However, what about the horizontal? What about this forgiveness? And I really believe that I was hearing from the Lord on this. I really, really do. And I had to search my heart. I had to examine my heart. There's things from my past, things that really went south. There were, there were people that I was really at odds with and I had to search my heart. And over the years, I've continually gone back because you know how sometimes you forgive somebody and then over time, something happens, something said, you see them in the store uh, and you, that feeling, that, that anger, that, um, that bitterness that you thought was gone and maybe it was gone. But whatever the case, sometimes there's things deep inside of us that we're unaware of that opened the door again. And so I just want to minister. First, I want to talk just briefly about the Lamb of God. When There's coming a day when he's going to take a book, and that book is the book of seals. And when he breaks open that first seal, that's going to be the beginning of the end. And it's going to happen one day. And I just want to, to focus on that just for a moment that there was, they looked all over heaven. They looked all over. It's, well, they're going to, this is future tense. They're going to look all over in heaven and they're not going to find anybody that's worthy. When John got this revelation, he was seeing future tense. And so they were looking all over the earth. They looked in the earth, under the earth. There's creatures, there's people, you know, in hell, there's, there's all kinds of stuff going on that, you know, would, we're not going to get on that rabbit trail, but in other parts of the, of the earth, they couldn't find anybody. And so John began to weep. He began to weep bitterly, deeply. He was weeping. And so why was he so upset about this book not being open? The reason is because when we became born again, when you were saved, Assuming that everyone is saved, everyone has become born again. When we became born again, he gave us the promise, the guarantee of the Holy Spirit. He gave us the, um, the installment. I don't want to say the installment. The, the first part of that redemption. See, we still have a sin nature. You hear it a lot taught that we have a body of sin. And so the sin nature still resides in us. And so we still can go back to the old man and default that way. And we can go the wrong way again. We could, we could fall from our faith. We could fall away. God forbid. But Jesus, when he opens that book of seal, that's the beginning of the fullness of that redemption where eventually there's going to be the rapturing of the saints and there's going to be the eradication. I'm talking about the utter destruction of the sin nature. So this body is going to be destroyed. So the struggle that you or I might have right now is going to be completely removed in, in absolute, thorough, finished, I mean, completeness. 
It's going to be done. It's going to be over with. And so John was weeping because he had that revelation and he understood that that is what was at stake. But as the story goes, he saw a man and he looked like the Lamb of God. And he was the one. He was that one person, that one man in all of human history that existed, that was worthy and that was able to take the book out of the Father's hand, to break the seal, to open it, and to read it. And so nothing concerning the very end times. I'm talking about Daniel's 70th week. I'm talking about, you know, the last seven years that have to happen. None of that can even happen until Jesus breaks that seal, okay? And so on the other hand, so he was the only one who was worthy. He was also the only one who was worthy to go to the cross. Right. He was the only one who was worthy to make that payment mm -hmm. yeah. possible, to, to pay that price, yeah. to, to bring reconciliation where we who were once far off, who were separated from God, we had no way to have access to the Father. So because of Jesus Christ, he repaired the breach, he brought it together so now we could be joined with God like right now, we, we can have heaven on earth. Yes. Amen? Yes. We can have heaven on earth. On the other hand, it's, it's going to be so much better, though. <laughs> it's going to get so much better. And, and look, we, we need to do the work of the ministry. We need to allow God to use us. And so the book of Hebrews chapter 10 verse 12 says that there were continual sacrifices that were made. Sacrifices were made continually. Under the old covenant, we're talking about old Israel, when Moses had given the law and said, this is how we're going to uh, have this relationship with Jehovah God is through the sacrifices. And, and he laid it out and put out the order of how everything had to be done. And there were annual sacrifices. There were uh, sacrifices that had to be done continually because it would only cover the sin. It would not remove the stain of sin, right? And so because the stain of sin was always still there, it was covered, and that covering was powerful. That not, I'm not trying to diminish or, or, or reduce you know, the power of what, what was done through those animal sacrifices, but they could not do. They could not do what the only one who was worthy could do. So when he became the sacrifice, when Jesus came to the earth, he became, so he became the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice. And so everything and all these animals and these other types of sacrifices that were made, they were figures. The Bible calls them figures. And I know in our English language, we hear more like shadows and types, which the Bible says shadows as well. But they were figures and they were shadows of what was to come. And so when Jesus came, he made it complete on the front end of it. And so we still have the back end of it. And that's when he grabs the book, he breaks the seal. And then the very end, the, be the beginning of the end starts to roll. Okay, so it's really interesting because this one sacrifice, Jesus, so remember, they had to have these animal sacrifices continually over and over and over. And every time that they would have to have those sacrifices, I believe that they, they, their conscience felt that, man, it's still, it's still there. It's still there. But the good thing with Jesus and his sacrifices, it's gone. The conscience is completely clear. That part it is eradicated. Look, when I sin, the guilt, when I confess my sin and I connect with what Jesus did at Calvary, that guilt is gone. That conscience is clear. It is purged. It is completely purged. And then we're free. We are truly free. And so we have to see the big picture that there's a spiritual realm, right? There's demons and there's evil spirits. There's dirty, wicked spirits. There's fallen angels. There's principalities. And we see in the book of Daniel where he demonstrates, he, he shows us that Gabriel and Michael the Archangel, there's the angels, there's good ones, there's bad ones, and they're over whole nations and they're influencing leaders. And then underneath that, now this is me speaking, okay, not the word of God, but it, it it gives the idea that these are leaders, they're principalities that are over it, and then there may be other, not principalities, but maybe just evil spirits, dirty, wicked spirits, right. demon spirits, yeah. as it cascades down. And they go to people like me, because I'm not saying I've got a, a, a big old principality that's working on me, okay? <laughs> but you get the idea. So, And it's the same thing with Satan. So when we refer to Satan, we're, we're referring to the kingdom of darkness. Yeah. 
and what he does. And the thing is, Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross and, and he rose from the grave, really just after he died on the cross, he had to be raised from the dead. But when he died on the cross, the veil was rent in the temple, right? That's, I'm talking about the temple, right? The temple. There were Jews in Israel. They had a temple and there was a curtain that only the, the high priest. The, the only this one priest could go in there, okay? And so the common man didn't have access. So when that veil was torn, and you know that it was torn from the top to the bottom, right? It's like 60 feet tall. They said the thickness of that, that veil was thicker than the man, the breadth of a man's hand. It's extremely thick. And so God himself had to tear that. And God made the most powerful statement that this fallen earth will ever see or hear or know. And that's when he made a way. He made a way so that we could go in. We don't have to rely on some other man for our confession. We don't have to rely on some other woman for our confession. We can go directly to the most holy place, to the high priest who is there. And he takes us in. He takes us in. And I, and I wanted that. So he was setting the stage for our whole life. So from the moment that you became born again, the stage is set. Now we have to continue to go back to the cross, connect to that and let his forgiveness continue to flow into us. And then sometimes it hits something it, and it's like, it's not, it's, it doesn't hit something. There's a clog in there somewhere. It's supposed to flow, you know, it's supposed to go freely. And so there's times when it hits something and it's like, okay, what's going on? Great. We're going to dig into that. So I, I just want to challenge you. Do you want to be the salt of the earth like Jesus talked about? Or do you want to be a pillar of salt? One way or the other, you're going to be salt. <laughs> so remember Lot's wife, right? Lot's wife, she was the one who, when they were pulled out of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom, they were told not to look back. Remember the two angels were sent there? In my view, I believe they're a shadow. I believe they're a figure of the two witnesses. The two witnesses that are going to come in the book of Revelation. Yeah, I can't prove that. That's just what I think. That's the way I look at it, right? They're like types of witnesses. They went in and they took them out and they were told not to look back. They were given specific stern instructions not to look back. And that's exactly what Lot's wife did. She turned around. She looked back. She became a pillar of salt. Now, I'm sure that salt could be used for something. I'm sure a cow could walk up to it and lick it and, and get some, some, you know, some uh, electrolytes out of that, you know, but... I'm talking about the usefulness of Lot's wife is no no good, but uh, but salt that you can you can salt you can do something with salt, and so that's the thing we need to see what's going on. The, the the devil is placing people in our lives that many of them have been called to be in our lives. He's placed the devil that got those people that God's placed in our lives. Those people that the devil has put in our lives, and we need to be able to discern and recognize which is which, and we need to cut off those relationships. That, that are leading us down, that are, that are leading us to a place of hardness. And so Matthew 5, 21, I wanted to go there. Matthew 5, chapter 5, verse 21. Okay, I hope you can still follow along with me. I'm going to read from the NASB. It, it reads a little bit easier for me. It says, uh, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and there, remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your offering there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. And I'm going to stop right there. So what Jesus is explaining, and, and, and I thought that I felt like it was really good to start at that verse 21 where he's, see, he's talking about words, things that you say. And, and, and how, you know, we can murder somebody's character. We can murder somebody's, their, their, their spirit within them. And, and we can crush them by the things that we say. And, and that's one of the things the Lord's been dealing with me about. Like just when I get frustrated on my job or whatever. And just the things that come out, it's like, Lord, help me. 
Lord, help me. And so, but what it does is it, re it reveals to us what's in there. And a lot of times we don't see what's in there, but it's not always tested. You know what I'm saying? It's not always pushed to the max to where it's really tested and we see what's really in there. And we, we need a little frustration, you know, to really see what's in there. We need to go through something. And, you know, a lot of times I've noticed in my life, I just never was really, I wasn't always going through anything, you know. And so I felt like I was a really good, strong Christian, but I just wasn't being tested. I have to be honest about it, right? We need to be tested because how do we really know that we're ready for what is down the road, what could be around the corner? The, the, it could be persecution. It could be something that's more raw and more real. And, and, and God's word promises us. Jesus has promised us. Paul said it. The apostle Paul said, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And so as an American Christian, it's like, okay, well, where's that for me? Um, is it just being made fun of on my job? Is it being mocked? You know, is it being looked down upon, talked about behind my back? Maybe that's what it is right now. I, can, I don't have a promise. It's only going to be that. But my thing is this, is that we need to be able to deal with the struggles that we currently presently have in our life. And we need to examine ourselves and we need to evaluate ourselves in the smallest little minute things because those little things may not be all that there is that we have to face. There may come, and so it is a training ground, is it not? It's, it's a time of te testing, right? Testing. He's testing us and he's preparing us for what could be coming. And God wants to make us strong and God wants to, he wants to shake it out. He wants to settle out whatever it is that's in there. He doesn't want it to come out where we're constantly speaking, you know, inappropriate things or, you know, that's not how I mean that. It, he wants to shake it out and bring it to where we can see it. And then we take it to the cross and we give it to him and we let him surgically remove it. the circumcision of the heart. Right? Where he comes in and he cuts away that flesh. He cuts away the garbage, the trash, because he owns us. I love when, when Pastor Matt said that. He owns you. <laughs> I love that. I mean, you know, you can look at it in a negative kind of time. I don't know why you would. It's the Lord, right? He owns you. But the thing is, when he's asking you to do something, or maybe I should say when he's telling you to do something and you, and you resist and you don't, you, know, you don't listen, then it's like he owns you. He owns you. And I'm going to tell you, when, when, when I just obey him, however long it took struggling, you know, before I would just obey him, I'm never disappointed. I am never disappointed. So we're seeing here in this passage where he is illustrating that it's the spirit of the law. So it's not just murder. It's not just actually, you know, physically killing somebody, but it's the spirit behind it. And Jesus scaled it back. He scaled it back and he took it right down to a heart issue. It's a heart issue. And then when he talked about bringing your gifts to the altar, that had to do with those sacrifices I was just talking about earlier. Those sacrifices, they had gifts that were associated with the sacrifices that were being offered up for themselves. And when they would bring a gift, it had to be something good. It had to be something that was pure. It had to be something that was acceptable. And what Jesus is addressing, you bring these gifts to the altar and you're at odds. You're quarreling with somebody and you haven't made things right with them. He's getting to the spirit of the sacrifice. He's getting to the spirit of the law. And the same thing applies to us. When we come to God and we give him our gift of praise and we give him our gift of worship and we give him the gift of just consecration, we pray, we seek his face. And then and, and there's, there's something between us and someone else. Look, this could be something from years and years in the past. Look, there are dark doors that have been opened up in people's lives, which leads to demonic possession. It leads to demonic uh, or demonization, however you want to word. I know that was something that kind of came up several, several months ago. But doors are open for a reason. And, and, and we are the ones who have the permission to open or keep them closed in our own lives. And so... One of the things that I know has a big, it has a lot to do with sickness and disease is bitterness. It's unforgiveness. The Bible talks about it. The Bible talks about that. And so, look, this is a message of freedom and liberty. This is not a message of condemnation. Hellfire and brimstone is real. <laughs> OK, look, I, I, one time I had done some research and I, I was really surprised. Jesus talked more about hell than he did heaven. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. did. But we need to present it in such a way that people know there's a way out. People know yeah. there's there's good news to this. It's not really that good of news, right? If you don't have 
if you don't have the other end of it, like how do I get free? How do I get set free from this? And so what God wants you and me to know is that when we worship him, when we pray, we need to make sure that our hearts are clean and clear. And, and one of the most difficult things to do is to, to have, the, have to deal with God after he shows me that there's someone in my past that I still have unforgiveness toward. And I may need to call him up or text him or something or go see him and make it right. And the thing is, when that happens, the floodgates open. It's like a pipeline where there's valves all along the way. You know, it could be a perfect flow until you get all, almost all the way to the end, but there's a valve right there, it's shut. It doesn't matter. Look, any unforgiveness, any bitterness, any resentment that we have in our lives, it is going to block the flow of God in our lives. You, you may be able to sense his presence. I'm not saying you would never sense his presence, but it's not what it could be. You may... may struggle to hear the voice of God. That could be what hinders to hear the voice, to really hear what God, God is saying when he's speaking to you. And so I want to encourage you to open yourself up. There's one, there's a quote that I, I had come across many years ago. This is one of my favorite quotes on this topic. Booker T. Washington. I'm telling you, this is one of the most amazing quotes. Booker T. Washington said, I will permit no man to narrow or degrade my soul by making me hate him. I mean, isn't that amazing? This is a man who absolutely understood forgiveness. He understood how to walk a life of freedom and liberty. Yeah. This man understood it. I thought that was powerful. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, Jesus is teaching the disciples how to pray. Remember, they asked him, Lord, teach us how to pray. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. He doesn't imply that I can be forgiven any other way. The only way I can be forgiven is that in that process where he's given me forgiveness, I'm willing and I'm ready to forgive myself, forgive you know, the, uh, those who've offended me. It's impossible, Jesus said, that offenses won't come. Offenses are going to come. They will come. I'm going to offend some of you. Some of you are going to offend me. It's just going to happen. And you know what? It doesn't matter whether we always agree on everything. It just doesn't matter. Does it really matter? Look, we had a Bible study on a Sunday night. This was several, several months ago, too. And it was on division. And, uh, you know, Pastor Matt had asked me to, you know, to, to do a teaching. And, and I just prayed about it. And I felt like that's the direction we were going to go. And so I brought a bunch of scripture on it. And I'm going to tell you, this is one of the best Bible studies I was involved in. Because everybody around that table. You, were you there? I think Brother Bill was there. I think Brennan was there. It was, there was quite a few of you that are here were in that. Man, it was an amazing, everybody was participating, but it's like the revelation that was coming across and it was about division. But you know why the revelation was coming across so strong? Because it was so much unity at that table as we were breaking open the word of God, talking about division. And don't you know, it was like right after that Bible study, we began to see a lot of things happening, just attacks, just think, you know, the, the enemy was trying to pick people apart, trying to pull people away. And, and I think that the enemy has somewhat succeeded at that point right here, right now where we're at. But we have to continue to fight and endeavor to stay in unity. We have to. We have to fight. It doesn't matter if you agree with what Pastor Matt says every single time. It doesn't matter. It doesn't. We have to know that we're all human flesh and no one has it all figured out. No one. And it's okay. It's all right. And we can go, we can talk with one another. We can disagree with one another and we can move through it. We can move yes. through it. I thank God for that Bible study. I thank God for that Bible study that, that Pastor Matt and Robert and uh, I know Sabrina early on was a part of that Bible study. And man, praise God for that Bible study that led to this church. Amazing. Amazing. So look, it's not an option. You understand he owns you. Remember, he owns me. He owns me. So it's not an option. I can really extremely dislike the person, but it doesn't matter. It's not an option. He says, he, he's, he's not, it's not in a question. He's saying, look, this is how you pray. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So if I'm praying that way, what I'm doing is I'm acknowledging to God. I'm letting him know I'm already doing it. Forgive me as I'm forgiving my debt. The ones who've done me wrong, forgive me as I am. See, in other words, as I'm praying this prayer, I'm already doing that. I'm already walking in that, you know? So if that person from the past, you know, comes back to mind, I start to feel these weird emotions. Look, that could be a demonic spiritual attack. 
That doesn't necessarily mean it's you, you. It could be just an evil spirit that's trying to stir up some emotions. Look, the enemy does that. Believe it. He does that. And you don't have to give in to it. You don't have to uh, submit to that. It's not necessary. It's not necessary. So Ephesians 4.32. He says, forgive as God in Christ forgave you. Forgive as God in Christ forgave you. Hallelujah. Forgive as God in Christ forgave you. Every time, I mean, it's all over scripture. Just about everywhere you go, you eventually will run into something on this theme. This is a common theme because this is an intricate part of the foundation of our faith. Forgiveness must flow. Forgiveness must continue on. Forgiveness doesn't just stop at the cross. Forgiveness doesn't just stop at birth, at spiritual birth. Forgiveness must continue on because there are going to be offenses. As we go through this dirty, earthly world, we're going to pick up mud and dirt on our feet. It's going to get nasty. We're going to, we're going to offend people too. You're going to do stuff that's really going to be wrong, you know? And, and then, you know, you're going to have to deal with it from your end on, on that as well. And the thing is, the, if, look, if I'm a forgiving person, I'm making it easy for that person and anyone else who needs forgiveness from me to come to me. If I'm not a forgiving person, and then look, there's someone that's done me wrong and they did something so harsh and so severe, like so significant. And, and like they really need to come to me. But I can be the kind of person where I'm not approachable. They can't come to me. Look, we're the body of Christ. How are we going to keep unity if we're going to isolate one member of the body? We've got to have it all together. It's got to all be tied in. We all have to have access to one another. We have to. Look, you can come and bring correction to me and I can disagree, but... You need to be able to know that you can bring correction to me. Seriously. Luke 23, verse 34. Luke 23, verse 34. One of the most powerful statements of forgiveness. Jesus is hanging on the cross. He's already there. And look at that. Wow. Wow. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing his garments among themselves. As he's praying for God the Father to forgive them, they're just continuing on, making an absolute mockery of him, doing nothing but insult him. After they've already beaten him, after he's already taken the whip across his back, the nails in his hands, he's there hanging, and they're still ridiculing him, making light of him, casting lots for his garments. There is no greater demonstration of love than that right there. And there's another figure, another type of Christ that we can see. There's the figure in David and King David. The king David represents the conquering king, represents Jesus Christ when he comes back for the millennial reign, when he returns on a white horse and he conquers the whole world. Yeah, literally, he's going to conquer the whole world. He's going to do what the Jews wanted him to do the first go round. They wanted him the first time. They wanted him to be the conquering king. But instead, he was expressing himself as the Lamb of God. But when he comes the next time, he's going to come as the conquering king. Trust me. They're going to wish he was the Lamb of God when he comes as the conquering king. It's not going to be anything like they thought. Not going to be anything at all like what they were expecting. It's going to be wild. Just read the book of Revelation. You'll see. It's going to be really wild. But he's going to bring all things to their end. So the other figure that I really wanted to, to, to mention is Joseph. Remember the story of Joseph and his brothers and all the, all the horrible things that they did to Joseph, throwing him in the pit and selling him into slavery. All the hardship that he went through, being in prison, being falsely accused of sleeping with another man's wife. An authoritative figure in the Egyptian Pharaoh. And Joseph stayed true. Joseph, he's a, see, Joseph is a figure of Christ as a suffering servant. Joseph is a figure of Christ. Someone who's betrayed by his brothers. Was Jesus not betrayed by his brothers? When you just break it down and look at all these little details, the forgiveness that Joseph gave to them when they came and they needed him. Absolute mercy. He was testing them. When you read the story, it talks about how Joseph was testing them. He was trying to feel it out and see where are they really at. Have they changed? Are they still the same? Do they feel any remorse? Is there any regret? I mean, the last thing he knew, he was sold and, and sent off with the Ishmaelites. 
And so he was probing him to see. And, and you know, so at first, you know, not if you not, don't really know the story and you read it, you, you could possibly think, wow, man, he's just being so, so mean. It seems like he's bitter. He's not bitter. What does he do? He, he has to break away, go, go out away from him to cry and to weep. So that's, G, that's a picture of Jesus. It represents the suffering servant. But I'm looking forward to when he comes looking more like King David, the conquering king. That's going to be amazing. Look, seeing the whole picture, look, we have to forgive people. We have to let things go. Look, you have to, I have to let things go. The reason why is because when Jesus comes back, when he returns, when, when he returns for the rapture, he's back on a white horse. When all that, all that unfolds and plays out, he's going to pour out his wrath on this whole earth. The Bible talks about the plagues and the trumpets and the, the bowls or the vials, depending on what translation you read. When he pours that out on the whole earth, look, what he's actually doing in that is he's purging this fallen earth. He's purging it of the innocent blood. Peter talks about it's going to burn with a fervent heat. The elements, everything in this earth is going to burn up. He says heaven and earth is going to pass away. And in the way I, this is just my perception. So I think of a person when they die, we, we say they passed away, right? So, but they, when, if they're in Christ, when the rapture takes place, they're going to be resurrected. They're going to be pulled up. And, and there are parts of that body that's going to, the sin nature part's going to be eradicated. But there's going to be an element to it that's going to be similar. Not the same, but similar. But they saw Jesus, remember, after he raised from the dead? They didn't recognize him at first, but then he showed him his scars, right? He had the scars from when he was in the other body. And the Bible tells us that when we see him, we will be like him, right? We're going to be like him. Isn't that pretty awesome? <laughs> I want to be like Jesus, you know? So that's, look, we got to see the big pit. Let's see the whole thing. I know we can't do this every single time, but this is a good time to do it. Let's see the whole picture. What's Waiting on the other side. I was talking to one of my coworkers this this time out offshore. I work on an offshore platform, and uh, we work really closely together. And uh, he he's a professing Christian, um, and, and I've been trying to get him to come and join in with us when we do our Bible studies. He hadn't made it yet, but he keeps telling me he's going to come. But so you know, when you can't get somebody to come and join you in something like that, you go to them and you bring it to them. So that's what I always do. I bring it to him. And we just have conversations. So we started to talk and uh, he was saying, man, I just, I, I don't care if I'm just right inside the gates. I don't care if I'm, I'm, I'm the guy that patches the golden streets where, where, you know, there's a little bit of damage in the gold streets. <laughs> this guy's from Mississippi. You got to understand. <laughs> no offense. No offense, Miss Matilda. <laughs> so anyway. I was like, man, I said, look, I hear what you're saying, but I want to honor him. I don't want to be just right inside the gate. I don't want to be doing nothing like that. He says we will rule and reign with him. He says that we'll be kings and priests. Look, that's going to be based off of what we do here and now. What are you doing now? Is there unforgiveness in your heart that could be preventing you, hindering you? Is it maybe the flow of the Holy Spirit not flowing the way that it could be, the way that he could be? Or should be. It could be because of unforgiveness. I just want to challenge you to examine yourself and examine your heart because God has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us. He's coming. He's coming. And when he sets everything up, look, he's, I was talking about him purging the earth. He's going to, Peter talked about him burning the whole earth with fire. He's going to burn up all the elements, everything. It's going to be a brand new earth. It's going to be brand new heavens, the skies, everything is going to be brand new. And then Oh, let me back up. He's also got to purge the airwaves. Who's the prince of the power of the air? We got to purge him out, right? He's going to be bound up for a thousand years, right? Him, and I believe it's going to be every one of his agents, all of the other fallen angels, all the demon spirits. That he's going to purge the airwaves. So we won't have all that temptation like that. And then we're going to have glorified bodies. And somehow through it all, there's going to be some who still have this type of body that are going to survive and make it through because the Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah, it tells us a lot about little children growing up, right. playing in a snake pit. Can you believe that? There could be someone like Mikey right there. There could be someone smaller than Mikey. That'll be, they talk, no, they actually describe an infant. Yeah. They describe toddlers that will go up to a viper pit 
and they could be just right there in the pit with the snakes. But the snakes won't change. They, they won't hurt them. But this is the thing. So we know Jesus is the last Adam. You know, Paul calls Jesus the last Adam, yeah. right? And we know the first Adam was in the garden in the beginning, right? And so the first Adam is the one who named the animals. The last Adam is the one who's going to change the animals. He's going to change their nature. Can you take the spots off of a leopard? Can you take the stripes off of a tire? Jesus can. Yes, Jesus yeah. can. He's going to do more than that. He's going to go into the nature. And he's going to change the nature where the wolf is going to lay down with the lamb. The bears, the goats, and all these oddball pairs are going to be paired up together. Grazing the field together. You're going to have lions eating grass like an ox. And this is going to be the new world. It's a whole new world. Look, it sounds like a movie. Huh? That, that song is a whole new world. No, it is going to be a whole. It really is. No, this is the truth. The movie's a lie. That's not true. This is going to be how it is. And, and we need to see that. And we need to keep that in mind in everything that we do. Look, whatever it is, whatever your struggle is, whatever suffering, or what, it might be uh, children related. It might be spouse related. It might be work-related. You, you've got to see the big picture because it's going to encourage you. It's going to, it's going to help you to hang on longer. It's going to help you to know there's something that God is preparing for you, and, and God wants you to be a part of his kingdom. He's bringing his kingdom on earth, and it will be a thousand-year reign on earth, and then we step into eternity with him. Yeah. We're going to end up in heaven. That's what the Bible tells us. Yeah. He does tell us that, so... We have a lot to look forward to. Look, we have to see the big picture. We don't want to find ourselves building a kingdom on this earth. You don't want the, the roots. You don't want your roots to go down deep in the soil of this earth. Don't get earth satisfied. We're not going to be satisfied with this earth. There's another earth that he's going to recreate. There's another one that's going to be pure and holy. So once he's purged the airwaves, once he's cleansed you know, all the innocent blood that's been spilled into the soil, it's all going to burn up. All that's going to be just complete like dross coming off of gold. It's going to be burned away. That's what Peter tells us is going to happen. And he talks about a new heaven and a new earth. Peter tells us. John tells us. That's right. Isaiah alludes to it. I mean, it's all over scripture. This is going to happen. And we are going to be a part of it. And it is going to be amazing. You cannot even imagine. You can, you can try and imagine. You can get as many people at a table together and just all brainstorming. You can't even touch or scratch the surface. This is God. God has prepared this for you. God has prepared this for us. And we're going to be a part of that forever. We're going to be part of it forever. You hear me? Forever. Try and wrap your mind all the way around forever, for eternity. So we have to stay faithful. We have to stay true to God. We have to cling to the cross because the cross is our power source. That's how we continue to have the power. But the cross is always going to lead us to repentance. And so if there's unforgiveness, if there's bitterness in us, the Holy Spirit is going to convict us. And the Holy Spirit, what I'm talking about is there's an irritation when I'm struggling with it, when I'm fighting it and I'm resisting it, kind of like what he told the apostle, well, he told Saul before he became Paul, why are you kicking against the pricks? Or why are you kicking against the goads, depending on what translation? See, he was kicking against it. He was convicted. He, God was dealing with him and God wanted him. And God saw what was going to become of Saul when he became Paul. And so we also... In a similar way, we as believers, as Christians, we can have conviction and we can feel it. It's down here. I'm just going to tell you, it's down in this area. This is where it's at. And the Holy Spirit will deal with you and you will feel him and he is communicating with you. And if you will get up from wherever or whatever you're doing and go and pray and seek him and listen and, and tune in to what he's saying right here. He will give you clarity. He will give you clear thoughts. And he will tell you exactly what he wants you to do. He will tell you exactly what maybe he might want you to stop doing. The Holy Spirit, he has a relationship with us. And, and God the Father made a way through Jesus is because of what Jesus did. Remember, Jesus said, I have to go because if I don't go, I can't send you the helper. I can't send you the comforter, the Holy Spirit. And that's what the Holy Spirit is doing. That's what he does. So you're not having a bad, I like to say this all the time because this is exactly what I used to think. When I'm feeling that, 
oh, I must be having a bad day. I used to think that. No, friend, you got sin in your life. <laughs> you need to get right. You got sin that's unconfessed. Or you have sin that you've just been playing around with. These pretend confessions where there's no change, where you haven't really connected. Look, what I'm talking about is when you have a contrite, a broken heart, you're broken and, and you are truly sorry for your sin. You're truly sorry for what's going on. And you connect with God. You connect with the cross and you truly repent. There is a change. There is a metamorphosis process that takes place. It's an absolute change. Just like that caterpillar that becomes a butterfly. I'm telling you, it's so, it's so real. It's so obvious. The change that takes place. And so I just want to encourage you with that. I want to encourage you to embrace God's command because he's commanded us to do this. He wants us to diffuse the quarrels and divisions. Whatever they are among us. Is there somebody in here that you don't care for too much? Are you looking at them? I hope not. <laughs> Look, let's just be real. Everybody has somebody. Who's that sister symbol, that brother Brass, that carnal Arnold, that fleshly Betsy in your life? <laughs> Who is that? Who is that? There's got to be somebody, right? Because the devil's going to make sure. He's going to make sure they find you or you find them. Y'all are going to run into each other eventually. But God wants us to deal with this, man. Look, we have to get these things right. It's not worth it. It is. Look, it, look we just looked at what it's going to be like. You don't want to miss. You don't want to be just at the gates. And, and look, if your aim, if that's your target, if that's your target is to just make it to the gate, what if you miss that target? If your target is to get all the way in and like way, 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 way back in there. You miss that target, you'll probably still be in there, right? <laughs> I'm just saying live for God. I'm just saying do something for God. Be used of God. That's all it is. Be used of God. And don't let sin get in the way. Don't let sin hinder you. Don't let sin stand in the way. Don't let sin stand in the way. So Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. He says, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. You see, that's what's at stake. We lose unity. That's what's at stake if we don't forgive. That's what Paul is saying. That's what he's telling us. What's at stake is we'll lose unity. We won't be together. We're not walking in step. We're all divided. We're all against each other. And we accomplish little to nothing for God's kingdom. We have to be used of God. We have to. Because the other part of what's at stake is the souls that are not saved. The people that we have the ability to reach. The people that we have the ability to touch. Do you have to be cradled? Cuddled? Does somebody have to chase after you all the time? Just, just make a commitment. Be real. I don't, I don't want to be that, that Christian that's still drinking milk, you know, got a, a baby bottle in my back pocket all the time. It's time to grow up. It's time to, this is a big part of growing up. This is, this is a big part of growing up. And it, it hurts sometimes. It really hurts. It's difficult. It hurts my pride a lot to have to go to somebody and make things right and admit to them that, that I had something against them, that they offended me. It hurts my pride. My pride is at stake. So we can diffuse those quarrels and divisions that way is the last one. If you would stand up with me is the last one that I'm going to read Matthew. We're going to be in Matthew Haley. How many of y'all appreciate Haley and her faithfulness? She is so faithful. Always, always, always. Always faithful. I appreciate her. I know she doesn't really like that. I don't do it all the time, though. I think I've done it once before. All right, so there's quite a few verses here. I'm just going to read through them real quick, okay? And then uh, we're going to wrap this up. So it says, uh, Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven 
may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with slave with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him 100 denarii or denarii, however you say that. And he seized him and began to choke him <laughs> saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I have mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly father will also do the same to you. If each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. See, he's talking about the spirit behind all of that. It's the spirit. Look, it could be, it could be anybody or in any part of your life, God wants you to be sure that you have forgiven them for the wrong and the evil that they've done. Look, you may have already forgiven them, and it could just be an attack. The devil does that. That's what he specializes in. So don't confuse the two. If you've been redeemed and you've already dealt with it, you've already addressed it, okay. But deal with that evil spirit that's harassing you. But the thing is, God wants us forgiven. God wants us to know that we don't have to be all wrapped up in that garbage. So notice what I got to back up. There's one more thing. What was Jesus's answer when he said, how often do I have to forgive? Seven times seven. Y'all remember the revelation on that? I was watching somebody else teach and I was like, oh, wait, wait. <laughs> and it came to me. And then I went and talked to Jessica. And I, Jessica said it the best. I'm telling you, it was so amazing. So Daniel gives the prophecy of 70 weeks, right? 70 sevens. And what's 70 sevens? It's 490 years, right? And so what does that represent from the beginning of the end to the end of the end? So how often do you have to forgive till the end? That's what Jessica said. And when she said it like that, I was like, no, that was so different. I mean, she just summarized it, you know, I was like, gosh. So that's the answer until the end. No, it, for, I can do the math is 490 times. That's it. You know what I mean? There might be some that might push it to that limit. There might be, but that's not what he's saying. He's saying you have to forgive them until the end, until the very end. That's not circumstance. That's not by chance that it's in there like that. It has a significant meaning. Look, Jesus is not going to, he, he didn't. That's why he spoke in parables. He didn't always just put it out there to where you, you know, just spoon feed you. He wants us to dig. He wants us to be hungry. He wants us to go after him. He wants us to seek him in his word and in his presence. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So let's just pray right now. And look, if you have somebody, look, I, I know that there's some out there that maybe somebody did come to mind. Maybe there is someone. Maybe there are some, some people in your life. Just when we pray, just make it personal. Yeah. Make it personal. You don't have to come up here. If you want to, you can. And there's plenty of people that would love to pray with you. I know I would. Um, but make it personal. Make it personal, okay? Heavenly Father, we just come before you once again in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, for the power of your word. We thank you for the power of forgiveness, Lord God. And Lord, I know, I know, Lord, that you have called all of us in this place. You've called us out of darkness. 
And you have chosen us, Lord God, for such a time as this. You've chosen us to be a part of your kingdom. You've chosen us to operate in the authority and the power of the kingdom of God. You have called us and you've chosen us to be witnesses. And Lord God, to be witnesses, Lord God, we need to be free. To be witnesses for you and to represent your kingdom, we need to have the liberty to do so. And Lord, the same forgiveness that you have released to us right now, Lord, we want to release that same forgiveness, that agape love generated forgiveness. We want to release that to those who have offended us, to those who have wronged us, Lord God. I am asking you, Jesus. I'm asking, Father, that you would just speak to us with clarity. Speak to us. Lord, maybe it could be difficult sometimes, but God, even tomorrow, the next day, Lord, if there's anyone, Lord God, that still it's unresolved, that you would speak to them, that your conviction, that conviction of the Holy Spirit down in the belly, Lord God, where you speak to us, where you deal with us, Lord God, where you strive with man, you strive with us, Lord God, to get us on track, Lord. I'm asking God, that you would bring deliverance right now in the name of Jesus. And right now is the time to commit. Right now is the time to just give in. Give in to the Lord. If he's speaking to you, you need to obey. You have nothing to lose but pride. You have nothing to lose but, but nothing but absolute pain and hindrances. You have nothing to, you have everything to gain in Christ. You gain more of his love, more of his presence. You gain his power flowing through your life because the valve has been shut. It's time to open the valve of forgiveness, to forgive, to give, forgive and let go. Lord, we're not going to bury the hatchet with the handle sticking out the ground, Lord God. We're not going to put it in such a way where we could go back at a convenient time. If that person offends again, Lord, we bury the, we bury the whole hatchet, Lord God. It's got to be gone. It has to be completely forgiven, Lord God. And, and we do, yes. <laughs> Despite what the world says, we need to forgive and we need to forget. Yes. We need to forget yes. it. Let it go. Yes. Let it go. Forget it. Forget it. <laughs> it's done. It's done. Let it go in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord.